Water is a critical biological molecule. In fact, water is an essential molecule for all living things. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a bacterial cell or a fungal organism or a plant or an animal. It doesn't matter. If it's a living organism on our planet, it is completely dependent upon water. In fact, the human and other animal bodies are made up of somewhere between 60 and 75 percent water, depending on the stage of life that they're at. 60 to 75 percent of your body is made up of water. Now, within that watery environment, there are lots of different molecules that are critical to survival, but there are only four of what we call macromolecules. And that term macro just means big. These are the four literally large molecules inside of your cells that are responsible for the bulk of the structure and the function of those cells. Carbohydrate, lipid, protein, and nucleic acid. Now on this slide I've given four examples, one for each of the macromolecules, and I've written them out in chemical formula, at least two of them. I've done that on purpose. I want you to see the critical elements that we've discussed in action. So for example, the chemical formula C6H12O6 belongs to a molecule, a carbohydrate, that is critical to the functioning of the human body. This of course is the chemical formula for glucose. And as you may remember, glucose is a carbohydrate. It's a simple carbohydrate, or what we sometimes call a simple sugar. Glucose is a critically important molecule in biology because living things use glucose in order to produce a molecule called ATP. ATP is the currency of energy in living cells. Look at the formula for glucose. It has 6 and 12 and 6. It has lots of individual atoms in it, but the only types of elements in it are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Three of our four critical elements. Now, when you look at lipids, there are actually three different classes of lipids inside living cells. There are what we call fats or triglycerides. There are phospholipids. Those are the kind that make up cell membranes. And there are sterols. All three of these types of molecules, fats, phospholipids, and sterols, are lipids. Now look at protein. I've got an example molecule here with its chemical formula. This is a ridiculous looking chemical formula. You would never describe this particular protein this way. It just looks ridiculous. There are 238 carbon atoms in this molecule, 1166 hydrogen atoms, and so on. But again, the reason I wrote out the chemical formula is because I want you to notice the limited number of elements here. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. There also happens to be one iron atom and two sulfur atoms, but the vast bulk of this molecule is made up of those four critical elements. This happens to be the chemical formula for hemoglobin, which is the molecule inside of your red blood cells that carries oxygen to your cells. Finally, the fourth macromolecule is nucleic acid. There are two types of nucleic acid in our cells. There's DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, or ribonucleic acid. 
DNA and RNA, the nucleic acids, are critical because they make up our genes and they help take the information from our genes and use it to build proteins. We know that at the beginning of the history of our planet, when the first life forms emerged, they emerged from the oceans. And it's no surprise then that all of the life that came after those original life forms still took with them some of that history of being ocean based life forms. If you look at the water that's inside of our bodies, for example, it's not pure water, it's salt water. It has 0 0.9 or just about 1% sodium chloride in it. It makes sense. Our ancestral life forms came out of the oceans. And as a result, all of the life that has come since that time carries that memory of ocean life with it. Remember, human beings and other animals are between 60 and 75 percent of salt water. Water is highly polar and that means that all of the many different types of reactions that go on inside of our bodies are going to be interacting with that watery environment. As we said, water readily forms hydrogen bonds. Water makes a really nice solvent in nature. It's able to dissolve anything else that's polar. Things that are able to interact with water in this way, other polar molecules, in other words, are said to be hydrophilic. Remember, that term just means water loving. And that leads to the chemistry that we think of as like dissolves like. Polar molecules will be able to readily dissolve inside a watery environment. Hydrophobic molecules are different. Hydrophobic things don't like water. They are repelled by water because they have a different chemistry. Hydrophobic molecules have nonpolar chemistry, and therefore they cannot interact with polar water very readily. You can see hydrophobic chemistry in action if you own any clothing, for example, that is water repellent. Perhaps you have a jacket or some shoes that are water repellent or even waterproof. The way that that kind of clothing is manufactured is by sealing the cloth and the other materials in hydrophobic chemicals. When the water falls down, when you're outside in the rain, the water is unable to soak into the cloth or the other materials because there's a layer of hydrophobic material there. The water can only bead up. It can't interact with the hydrophobic molecules because they have different chemistry. Polar molecules readily dissolve in water. Think about sodium chloride. We said sodium chloride or table salt is capable of ionizing and it's going to ionize when it dissolves in water. Salt is a crystalline structure when it's uh, outside of water. You have salt at home in your salt shaker, but when you introduce sodium chloride to a watery environment, it's going to ionize. The sodium and the chloride are gonna dissociate from each other. The sodium is going to donate an electron to the chloride. So the sodium will become a positive ion or a cation and the chloride will become a negative ion or an anion. 
And those two ions can bond with ionic bonding. Now what you're looking at in this drawing is what happens to the ions themselves when they're in this watery environment. The sodium and the chloride are not living in isolation, in other words. They are dissolved in water. And remember, water has chemistry. It has polar chemistry. Because water is polar, it contains partial charges. And because ions are also charged, they will interact with water. So the sodium, for example, and it's with its positive charge, when it's in water, it will become attracted to and surrounded by the oxygen atoms in the water molecules. Remember, those oxygen atoms have a partial negative charge. The negativity of the oxygen and the positivity of the sodium will draw them together. Now, why is that important to know? Well, ions by themselves are actually quite small for the most part, but when they're in a watery environment, they become functionally large because they're surrounded by and attracted to water molecules. That becomes important because it makes it hard for these ions to get in and out of cells. They're big now, they're bulky. The term that we use is hydrated. These are now hydrated ions, and it's not gonna be easy for them to move in and out of a cell across a membrane because of that size. The chloride ion is doing the same thing when it becomes hydrated. It's interacting with water molecules. It's just that it's a different area of the water molecule that is attracted to the negatively charged chloride atom. Remember, it's the hydrogens in water that have a partially positive charge, and they will be drawn to the negatively charged chloride ion, which again is an anion. Chloride will become hydrated in water. It gets big in water because of these attractions. It will be difficult for a chloride ion to cross a cell membrane and get into or out of a cell. The other thing to remember, again, is that nonpolar things don't even interact with water. In this drawing, what you're looking at is a watery environment. You can see the individual water molecules here with the red oxygen and the two white hydrogens. And you can see all kinds of dotted lines here, the hydrogen bonds that form between the water molecules. And then in the center, you can see these strands of other atoms that are completely removed from the water. The black circles here represent carbon atoms. And although they're hard to see, there are white circles that again represent hydrogen. These drawings represent what we call hydrocarbon molecules, molecules that are made of only carbon and hydrogen. The carbon and hydrogen, remember, have equal electronegativity. And so when they come together and form covalent bonds with each other, they're going to be nonpolar covalent bonds, no partial charges in there. So these molecules, these nonpolar molecules, are simply unable to interact with this water. The water is polar, the hydrocarbons are nonpolar. When we think about our macromolecules, there is one macromolecule that behaves the way these hydrocarbon chains are behaving, and that's the lipids. Lipids are nonpolar. Among the macromolecules, they are the ones that will not interact with water. Now you've seen this in your life. 
Think about the last time you mixed up, for example, some salad dressing and you put together maybe some vinegar and some salad oil. You know that the vinegar, which is water-based, and the canola oil or the olive oil, whatever you use, you know that those two things don't mix with each other. The oil layers on top of the water. Even if you shake that salad dressing up, you might be able to, to uh, mix it up a bit for a minute or two, but it will always separate back out into the two distinct layers of oil and water. And that's because of this type of chemistry. Now I want to move on here and talk about some new terminology about the types of mixtures that water can form with different types of molecules. Now in order to understand these, we have to understand this term solute. Whenever you hear the term solute, all that means is some kind of molecule that has been dissolved in water. So a solute is a combination of a molecule and water. The molecule has dissolved into the water. So again, if you take some table salt and you sprinkle it into water and that table salt dissolves in the water, the table salt is now the solute. Uh, if you made coffee this morning, if you um, brewed up some coffee for yourself at breakfast, the coffee that dissolves into water is a solute. Maybe you put some table sugar into the coffee. The sugar is also a solute when it dissolves into the water. Now, when it comes to the water mixtures, there are three terms that we need to know regarding solutes. The first is suspension, the second is colloid, and the third is solution. There's a fourth term on the slide, but we'll talk about that separately. What a suspension is, is a combination of a large solute or even a cell type that is combined with water and actually settles out of the water. In other words, the solute is so big that even though it can dissolve into the water, it will actually settle out of the water over time and sink to the bottom of the container of water, in other words. Now, the other thing you can see in the definition is this part about scattering light. In a suspension, the large solute is capable of reflecting light. If light were shined directly onto those solute particles, they would reflect the light back. That's what we mean when we say that a suspension can scatter light. A good example of a suspension in the human body is blood. If you draw blood from a person and put it into a tube and then let the blood sit, the cells and the large solutes in that blood will settle out to the bottom of the tube over time. Now, let's compare that suspension to a colloid. A colloid involves a small solute in water. So a small solute that will not settle out over time, although the solute is not so small that it can't scatter light. In a colloid, the solute will scatter light, but it will not settle out over time. A good example of a colloid is gelatin. If you've ever made jello gelatin at home, you know that you dissolve the jello molecules into water and they stay dissolved. They don't settle out to the bottom of the container over time. There are other molecules that will form a colloid with water. 
including things like albumin, which is a protein, and dextran, which is a carbohydrate. Those will also form colloids when they're dissolved in water. The third type of water mixture is called a solution. Now people use the word solution all the time, but we're gonna learn the actual technical definition for what a solution is. If you compare it to the suspension and to the colloid, in a solution, you're dealing with small solutes again, but this time they're so small that they don't scatter light. They're too small to reflect back light that shined upon them, and they don't settle out over time. So if you go back to, for example, my, um, my description of table salt in water, or my description of sugar in water, or coffee with sugar, those are all examples of solutions. You've got a solute, you've got a molecule dissolved in water, but the solute happens to have particles that are small enough that they won't reflect light, they won't scatter light, and they won't um, settle out of the solution over time. So suspension, colloid, and solution are three terms that we can use to describe different types of water mixtures. There's one other term on this slide, and that's emulsion. Now I separated out this term in parentheses because an emulsion is not some polar molecule dissolved in polar water. Instead, it's a combination of a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule coming together. And when you put those two things together, and you agitate them, they will combine somewhat. Think about the salad dressing example. But when you let the combination, the container sit, the two things will settle out apart from each other over time. So again, some combination of something that's polar, like water, and something that's nonpolar, maybe oil. When you shake them, when you agitate them, they'll appear to combine with each other. But if you let the container sit over time, they'll settle out away from each other. That's an emulsion. On this slide, we're looking at pictures of the examples of the different water mixtures that we just talked about. In this image here, we're looking at the suspension of blood. Here's a tube full of blood that was just drawn from a patient. You can see it looks very homogeneous, top to bottom. But if you allow that tube to sit, because it's a suspension over time, the large solute molecules will settle out away from the rest of the, um, of the watery plasma or serum. Over here, you're looking at a colloid this is some kind of a gelatin mixture. Again, the solute is much smaller than what you're dealing with with blood. The solute will still scatter light, but it won't settle out over time. And down at the bottom, you're just looking at solution. This could be table salt or perhaps sugar, table sugar. When you first put it into the water, it's going to start to dissolve until you end up with a very small solute dissolved in water, one that will not scatter light and that will not settle over time. 